We Afrique is on a mission to make real change by facilitating solutions for our everyday lives. We'll be joined by professionals and influential individuals to share with you their journey and recipe for success. We ask about their methods and experience. Is it their career, their education, or is it their background? This is our secret source to enlighten, uplift, and empower the community where we are all special. Welcome to We A Freak Talk, where our support is our actions. If they don't believe you, tell them to subscribe to this channel. Please welcome our special guest, Dr. Chidi. For those who don't know who he is, I'll run you through a brief intro here. An award-winning lifestyle doctor, a surgeon, former lecturer in Cambridge University. He studied in Cambridge, UCL, and John Hopkins in the United States, international health and wellness speaker, advisor to federal government of Nigerian health, a business owner, featured in such publications as BBC, ITV, Sky, TED Talks, and he's got an upcoming movie, End of Medicine, which probably let us know a little bit more about it too, later on, featured in many publications such as L, Men's Health, Top Sante, to just name a few the times. Um, there's a lot of accolades and I could be here all day reading really. Um, so I would like to express my gratitude and thanks for taking time out of your budget schedule to speak to We Are Free today. Very excited to have you here today. Well, thank you, welcome and um... Glad to be here myself. Oh, excellent. So I want to kind of start off uh, in terms of your career. I just want to kind of go back in terms of growing up before you became a doctor. What was life like and what other interests did you have? Mm. Well, I mean, I, I grew up in England, born and raised in London, spent a little bit of my time outside. I was um, in some foster care as a, as a young child, but most of the time as a child growing up in a, just a very average place in, in South London. I got the medical bug, I guess, when, you know, my parents used to have these books. Um, and one of them was called The Ministry of Healing. And it was all about people like Dr. Kellogg of Kellogg's Corn Flakes fame. But this man was a pioneer in his day. So you're talking about the 1800s. People all over the world were coming to him to reverse diseases. He set up sanitariums, he cured people from diseases that nobody would, would, were doing at the time. And I thought, well, if this is possible, maybe I can do the same thing. And that's what gave me the, the medical bug. Yes, I had a very happy childhood. I mean, I spent a lot of time involved in sport, athletics, all sorts of things. So um, yeah, I had a, had a great childhood. Oh, fantastic, wow. Sounds like you had good inspiration from such an early age, which is sure. really, really good. And obviously your parents were pivotal to this. So yeah. how did your career start and what were your main source of inspiration? Yeah, so that was it. Uh, uh, Dr. Kellogg was kind of the one that kind of stood out for me because he was doing medicine that nobody else was doing. By that time, when I was, I was in secondary school, I said I had a good upbringing, but the secondary school was a pretty poor school. Okay. And very, very few people were going to university. But then, so I had it in my mind, okay, I need to get into medical school. So that started me, you know, getting down, starting to do all the work that I could possibly do. Very unpopular, very unfashionable at the time, you know, to be studying. You know, I'm in a school full of about 80% black kids, black boys, right? Um, wasn't a very good school. Most of them weren't interested in studying. So you're kind of standing out being somebody who's saying, no, 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 I'm not going out. I'm just going to stay at home and do my work. Um, what helped me is that I was good at sport as well. So, you know, nobody really criticised me too much. Yeah, so getting into medical school was the big thing. Hallelujah, that happened. But when I got in, I guess my head was turned because you go to medical school and all the, all the best people want to do surgery and all that sort of thing. So rather than doing what I thought was curing people, I... I decided, okay, well, let me go along the surgical route. I'm as good as everybody else. Why don't I train as a surgeon? I came out of medical school. I trained under Ben Carson. And, and you know, Ben Carson, in John, he was in Johns Hopkins at the time, one of the best neurosurgeons at the time. Since then, obviously, he's been in the cabinet with Donald Trump. But I realized then I couldn't be a neurosurgeon because it was just, it just wasn't me. So I came back, did orthopedics, I was training up in Cambridge, I was lecturing up in Cambridge, but then it hit me, 
you know what? Um, I need to go back to my first love, which is curing people from disease. You know, why do people have to have high blood pressure? Why do they have to have diabetes, cancer? Where's it all coming from? And realizing that the, the evidence was out there, the science was out there, that if we find out the root cause of the problem, well, then we can stop it and for many people reverse it. And for me, that is just like the, that's the golden chalice at the end of the rainbow. It's, hey, maybe we can cure people from disease and get them off their medication scientifically. You know, not giving people all sorts of herbs and whatever, but really reversing the disease. So I, I left surgery. I said, well, what am I gonna do? I retrained as a GP. In the middle of that time, I spent a lot of time doing accident and emergency. Uh, covering certain hospitals and accident emergency, did general practice and then specialised in this thing called lifestyle medicine. So I went out to some of the best practitioners at the time. It, was, it wasn't really known at the time. Out in the States, California, um, the Cleveland Clinic, saw what they were doing. They were reversing heart disease. So instead of what I was doing up in Cambridge, doing heart bypasses on people, big operations, what they were doing was changing their diet and lifestyle and reversing the disease without any operation. So this was miraculous. So I said, well, this is fantastic. I took all of that and I came back and I said, well, if we can do it for heart disease, can we do it for diabetes? If we can do it for diabetes, can we do it for high blood pressure? And we just, the list kept growing. Yeah. And that's when I started up the practice. And throughout that time, I was also, I owned a couple of plant-based restaurants in Soho. And they were doing so well. They were making so much money. I was thinking, well, you know, maybe I should be doing this more than the actual medicine. But, you know, I had to keep my feet on the ground. And that's kind of where it all took off for me. Wow. That's quite incredible, honestly, that you managed to realise that there's a bigger goal and also a, a bigger change that you can make in terms of society and human yeah. beings and just saving lives and, yeah. It's okay. quite an amazing achievement. And obviously, one of the questions I was going to ask later was to do with your restaurant, but we'll probably get that to that in a little bit. One of the key things that you mentioned here is when you left medicine. So what lessons did you learn at your time working as a doctor? Was it to be kind of adaptive? And obviously, this bureaucracy also associated with the medical profession. Mm -hmm. Did you face any of these kind of things? No, I mean, I, I have to say I had quite a... I had what you would call a classic path. So I, obviously I was at University College London. I then went up to Cambridge. I had the pick of the, the courses I wanted to do. I had no real issues. It was hard work. I mean, I mean my first job when I qualified, this was back, back in the nineties, right? Late nineties. When you were on call, you start your day normally at about six in the morning to do a ward round. Normally, you don't finish till eight, but when you're on call at the weekend, for example, you finish your day at Friday, on Friday evening. All your colleagues give you their pages. Now, you've got five pages. You're staying awake all night, Friday night, yeah. Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday night. You don't get a break because wow. everybody's... And then Monday, your boss comes in, couldn't care less about what you've been doing at the weekend. Your day just carries on as normal. So by the end of the day, and I remember there were some days on Monday, I wouldn't get home, I wouldn't leave till 10 o'clock in the evening. And nobody's going to thank you. Nobody's, you're just the slave of the, um, of the hospital. So it started off quite difficult, but that's what everybody had to do. Um, so if, if you learn anything, you learn to work very hard and you learn to be quite economical with your time and your decision making. As I progressed, I realized, I mean, I'm, I'm still a doctor. I still go in practices, practice medicine, especially in the emergency medicine. Mm. But it's much more rewarding to be able to cure people from disease. I mean, I, I remember when I was a first year medical student, you have to see the dean. The dean asked me, so why do you want to be a doctor? I said, well, I want to cure people. And he looked at me and said, well, as doctors, we don't cure people, we treat people, okay? So there's a difference. And, and that's a disappointment. And I think the average person is disappointed in medicine when they realize that they're never going to be cured by some of the brightest doctors in the world. They're brilliant people. Yeah. Well, surgeons can do an awful lot of good, but usually you can't cure people. You can only treat them. Yeah. Um, so this is why I get so much joy from what I do. I take them back, you know, they're, 
their blood pressure goes back to normal, they get rid of the medication, their diabetes goes away, and they're free for life. Yeah. That's what I enjoy. Wow. I think that's one thing that's definitely missing nowadays in, <clears throat> in this medical profession, as you mentioned, you know, doing it for the good of the people rather than just doing it for the profits. So it, it's, it's one of these things where, you know, you, you could almost be described as controversial with some yes. of these pharmaceutical companies, you know, because empowering people to lead a lifestyle yes. without the need for medication you could almost be deemed as something who's going against your actual medical profession. What would you say, what would your response be to that? I think you're right, but I don't care. I mean, what, what matters? I mean, I, I'm not really interested in the esteem of my, my colleagues. I'm interested in the fact that you are freeing people from disease. And by the way, you know, maybe we'll talk about it later. You know, this kind of system is useful all over the world. You talk, you know, we are freak. I've been involved with lots of different states in Africa yes. who obviously can't afford to have a national health service like Europe or America. Yeah. But I say to them, why don't you just bypass all of that and get involved with actually curing people? It's cheaper. It's much cheaper than what we're doing in the States or what we're doing in Europe. So let's get involved with empowering people, giving people back control of their own health. You're right. Um, for some people, it will upset the apple cart. If I'm not prescribing loads of medication, there's certain people not going to make a lot, an awful lot of money. That's not my concern. My concern is just like, you know, if there's one thing I learned in medical school is to treat your patients like they're members of your family. Okay. So how would you want your members of your family to, to be treated? Yes. I want them to have the best possible treatment. I want them to be free of the disease and I don't want them to go bankrupt getting that treatment. So yeah, there is some resistance. I don't mind that resistance. Okay. No, no, it's fantastic. I think you've hit the nail on the head, you know. Uh, saving lives is more important than uh, profits, Absolutely. Uh, you know. And it's also, you know, in terms of karma, you know, you're doing something which is seen as normal, you know, yeah. and natural. That's, that's the key thing here. We, we have to just really applaud you for really taking that opportunity and yeah. being pivotal in terms of driving that forward. In your website... You know, beautiful website, by the way, I've got to say, um, uh, straight to the point, you know what you get, which I really like. You talk about lifestyle disease and it's uh, a way a person lives, how they eat, whether they exercise and how they think. Yes. Can you please explain for our viewers what is lifestyle medicine and why it's so important? So lifestyle medicine, it's, it's important that we call it medicine because it's, this is not alternative. This is actually based on scientific evidence which people can look up from some of our greatest scientific institutions, go to Harvard University, Cambridge, all of the facts that, that form the foundation of lifestyle medicine are built on that scientific uh, probity. But lifestyle medicine is really getting to the root cause of the disease, of lifestyle diseases. Now, we call them lifestyle diseases because diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, dementia, stress, depression, all of those things are a function of the way we live. They're not random. You know, we, we shouldn't be just afraid, oh, is, when's it going to strike me? Certain things we have to do in order to get those diseases. By the way, any of us can get any of these diseases. You can do everything right that you may think of, but you can still get a lifestyle disease. But what we're talking about is lowering the risk of you getting that disease. So for example, we know for obesity, if you eat more calories than you burn up, you're gonna put on weight, that's, that's a lifestyle. If you smoke, you're increasing your risk of getting lung cancer and other cancers. So we know that, so we know those key elements. But when we go deeper for things like diabetes and high blood pressure, we can actually look at what you're eating, look at how you're thinking, and look at what you're doing with your body and say, okay, if we change a few things, we can get rid of those diseases. If we use your lifestyle to treat your disease, it's lifestyle that gets you into the problem, it's lifestyle that actually gets you out of the problem. What we miss in much of medicine is we don't even think about, well, what has been the cause of this issue? Why does this person have high blood pressure? We don't even ask that question. We just say, take this medication for the rest of your life, come back if you're getting a side effect. I mean, that's, that, for me, that's pathetic medicine. Mm. I'm disappointed with some of my colleagues who can just put up with that. I mean, some of the best 
cardiologists on the planet will just give you medication for the rest of your life and not really think about how you got there. In, in the website, you'll see it's all about meals, movement, and mindset. If you can address those three issues, you can be free. Wow. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head. It's definitely the meals, mindset, and movement. Um, I think as long as you combine those three, mm. and you take care of your body in terms of what you put in and what you take out, which alludes back to your point, the yes. meals, mindset, and movement, it definitely is a, a way of just prevention at an early stage. So and quite incredible. Another one of your quotes on your website, which I really loved was, I swapped the surgeon's knife uh, for lifestyle medicine yes. to save more lives. And obviously through your 20 years plus of experience and success, you've started um, multiple businesses. You mentioned earlier on about the plant-based restaurant. Yes. What was your favorite part of creating the restaurant and, and why was that? I just saw that there was this big gap there. I mean, so I wanted to promote healthy living, healthy food, and a lot of it was plant-based. So I, I hold my hands up and you wanna be really healthy, the best diet you can have is a very heavily plant-based diet. But at the time when I was opening up that, when I was thinking about that restaurant, all the plant-based vegan veggie places, they all looked a bit unattractive, let me put it that way. I mean, you know, if you go there, you gotta have long hair, sandals, and look really, <laughs> That, that wasn't appealing to anybody. And okay. not, for me, it's still not appealing. So I wanted to create a place that was very healthy, but looked fantastic and had beautiful food and was cheap. That's sometimes difficult to, to square those circles. But yeah, we did it quite well. We started off with a healthy fast food restaurant. Okay. Rather than going to McDonald's, you come to us. We were in the center of Soho. So there are lots of people who kind of engaged in that kind yeah. of lifestyle. But we became quite successful quite quickly. So then we opened up an a la carte restaurant. And for me, the, the, the best part of it is the conception, bringing this idea to fruition. Yeah. It's a thought one day and a couple of years later, you've got this thing and crowds of people are coming in. And obviously the celebrities, McCartney, Madonna, all those people were, were piling in because they were interested in the health. Yeah. And where they go, you know, we used to have lot, we used to be right next to a modeling agency and where all these models pile in and where all the models go, everybody else follows. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, it was a fantastic, very difficult to get. I mean, I, I didn't have a background in um, restaurateur, being a restaurateur. It was the drive, it was the, 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 the concept, the idea that drove it all. Okay. Yeah, it was so strong. So I, I made loads of mistakes, but I just feel that the, the concept was the one that, that drove it on, trying to get that healthy lifestyle for people at a cheap price in a beautiful place. That, that was it. That's amazing. I think yeah, what, conceptually, as you said, if once that drives in, it almost validates your original idea of actually getting it out there, which is absolutely excellent. Um, so just kind of following up from that, did you have any challenges setting up this restaurant? You know, so, so what were some of the challenges you faced and how did you overcome them? <laughs> I mean, there's a few challenges. So for example, when I was setting it up, I was a surgeon, I was up in Cambridge. Yeah. So here am I setting up a restaurant in central Soho, massively expensive place to have a, <laughs> to have a restaurant. Probably wouldn't be the best idea to start in Soho. Yeah. But I was going back and forth to Cambridge, living in London, back and forth to Cambridge, and then trying to manage this restaurant at the same time. So that was a major, major challenge. and getting those systems in place so that your staff, your suppliers, everything was working, very difficult. But eventually I got the systems right and we got the right manager, we got the right chef, so that after a couple of months I could come down, check on everything. I didn't really have to be so hands-on, but I was still getting on with my surgery. But at the same time, I started to think, that was when I was moving from surgery. I was saying in my mind, this is much more important than surgery. I had customers come in leaving notes saying, look, um, since I've been coming to you for the last month or so, I, I require less medication. Just because I'm coming to you three times a week, I yeah. require less medication. So they're leaving all these notes and I'm saying, yeah, we're doing much more beautiful work here than yeah. I'm doing cutting people open. And that's what helped me tip the balance. Having that validation for seeing it come to life people leaving uh, testimonials and notes 
of really just knowing that you're actually making a difference to the community Absolutely. and people that's in general. Yeah. It kind of just fuels you, mm. drive you forward. It's kind of a follow-up to that. So the restaurant is only plant-based, so no yeah. dairy. Yeah, that was totally plant-based, no dairy. Um, it was quite unusual at the time. Yeah. Because but we didn't advertise it really as a vegan restaurant. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not one to adopt that vegan uh, lifestyle. It's more about plant-based. Obviously lots of vegans came because they loved it. Yeah. And they would complain and say, why don't you put vegan up? I said, well, if I put vegan up, it puts everybody else off. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say 90% of the people that came into that restaurant were not vegan, were not even vegetarian. Two, three times a week, they wanted a meal that could fill them that looked good and felt good. Well, I wanted to promote it to people who are not the typical vegans. Okay. And I, and I still do that today. I mean, a lot of the things that we do is heavily plant-based, yeah. not exclusively, but heavily. And it's just to invite everybody and don't be put off by the labels. Oh, excellent. I think that's great. You know, currently everyone is kind of facing this situation where we've been locked in for quite a number of months. Mm -hmm and health mental health obesity diabetes all of these things have kind of crept up how does a meal look for someone looking to prevent some of these uh, diseases that you, you mentioned previously yeah well it's a good question because as we're talking you know we're in the middle of this still this pandemic yeah but even right at the beginning so there were two things that were important to me right at the beginning, March 2020, when we started the lockdown, and things were quite bad. People were dying quite quickly, actually. I decided, well, first of all, I need to go back to the emergency department, because at that point, we kind of thought the hospitals would just be overrun. Yeah. Um, and I'm used to running emergency departments, so I, I just needed to go back, that was one thing. But I'd say the most important thing that I thought about was, look, at the time, and even today, the vast majority of people that die, I can give you statistics from Italy, it was 99.2% of the deaths from COVID-19 had at least one underlying disease. So they either had high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, something like that. Yeah. And lo and behold, th those are my areas, right? Yeah. Those are my areas. So mm -hmm. whilst we were scratching about looking for treatments and everything, for me, it was okay, well, Obviously, this weakness in the system, if you're a diabetic or if you have high blood pressure, this coronavirus really targets you worse than anybody else. So this is the perfect opportunity for people to get rid of those diseases. Yeah. And, and that is what I'm all about. So as well as going back to A&E, I decided, well, let's get it out there. Let's make sure everybody knows how we can start reversing these diseases, whether it's privately with me, we're working on a few things to, to get an app together so that people can do this in the, in the leisure of their own homes. But the talks, the courses, all of those things were, were done so that we can actually get to the root of the problem rather than just the symptoms. You know, prevention is better than cure. Yes. And we're spending billions on cures. Well, they're not even cures, they're treatments. But let's spend a bit more on prevention. Amazing. Yeah, I could imagine the... Uh... The amount of work that you put in, obviously, with your experience as well, and knowing that you know what you're talking about, and it's been proven from your testimonials on the website, which I saw the other day, obviously giving back, empowering people, shining the spotlight on them, always been your kind of passion, so they can take control back of their health by tackling the root cause of the problem, as you mentioned, rather than addressing the symptoms. How has this impacted your life? Well, I think it's... I like to say to people, what is the definition of success? I mean, the definition of success to me is just understanding what your purpose is and doing it, right? It's not about how much money you're making. Yeah. It's not about how many accolades you get. Do you feel that you are in your purpose? Yeah. And if you feel that you're in your purpose and you're doing it, and your purpose usually must involve helping other people. Yeah. It can't be just about yourself. So you're asking me how it impacts my life knowing what I'm doing is impacting people and I'm starting to feel you know for the last 10 years that this is part of the reason why I'm here yeah it gives you a sense of peace okay so you ask me questions about well you know you must be 
unpopular with the medical profession. Okay, but I'm at peace with it because I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And I know what I'm doing is not for me, it's for, it's for other people. So it gives me an awful lot of peace. Sometimes there are difficulties, but even in the difficulties you have peace because you say, you know you're doing the right thing. So it's impacted my life. You know, it's, I love doing what I do and it's, it's enabled me to do things I never thought I'd be doing. I've been speaking all over the world. I mean, even in this lockdown period, I, I probably reach more places in the world than I've ever done without the lockdown, you know, with, with this wonderful Zoom mechanism. Yeah. Certain, certain talks you reach in 30,000 people per night, 70,000 people per night. I mean, that's a football stadium. Yeah. I've never done that before. So, um, yeah, I, it's, it's been very good for me. Wow. Yeah, your success speaks volumes based on your drive to really know that you're within your purpose. And as you said, once you're in your purpose, doing the work comes a second nature because getting up in the morning is not a chore as some people would see it. Exactly. It is more of a, a lifestyle for you. You know, once you're doing good, you don't even have to see the rewards. You feel it, you know it, you're at peace with it. So I think that's really, really crucial. And I think if something our people can take away is really do something you love and give back, that's probably one of the key components that you mentioned. Thank you for watching the latest episode of We Are Freak Talk. We hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as we did. Be part of the We Are Freak family. Subscribe and share. And remember, we're here to shake things up, reverse the flow, and be great. I am because we are.